bathroom to build a new facility. I think she was all home. Okay. And the parking over there was not pretty good. And there's more stuff up here that's supposed to be coming. Do you want to again? Because they don't know their rules. Which is like a combination of those for and some other stuff out there. But it's I don't know how you kept them for I'd like to see even more stuff coming from I know the whole amount of stuff will come in from the ice rink. Because they're going to build another one right there. So there's one right beside it.
morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. How is it with your souls this fine day? Am I up? Good. It's a little cloudy, a little cool. Bundle up, snuggle, whatever. All right. I do have a few announcements that I want to share, and I'll try to do this quickly. Um, this, the presentation that I did on the listening sessions on September 11th, I'm going to repeat in the conference room following worship today. It's about 45 minutes, including conversation time. So if you want to hear it again and see if it's changed, <laughs> no, it hasn't. Or um, if you want to be part of it and uh, if you weren't able to be here, um, I'll be in that room about 10.15 probably. So grab some goodies and come along. Just an FYI, I got the hospitality people wrong this morning. I read the chart backwards, so it's all right. Next week, Tom Riggs and Maribeth. <laughs> so, so thank you, Joni. She's out there still, I think, yes, doing her thing. Um, on the 30th of October, we're going to have a busy day. It'll be a good busy day. So we start with noisy can offering for the Ministerial Association funds. And we'll be receiving new members into the church that Sunday. And we're also going to be celebrating all saints. So we'll be um, remembering in our prayer and in our worship the people from our congregation who've died in the last year. And if there are others that you want to have remembered, people in your family, whoever, um, just email or call the church office and leave that information for Carol. We'll make a list, OK? And you'll be able to say something Sunday, that Sunday, too, to me, um, if you forget to email or call. Okay. And finally, the board meeting. The church board is going to meet October 26th at 6.30. We had a couple scheduling conflicts, so we had to shift it to the next week. But of course, that's open to everybody. Just want you to um, be aware of the date change. Are there other announcements that you'd like to share as we begin our worship this morning? Sunday Singers will have our first rehearsal next Sunday after church, and then we'll perform on the 30th. Very good. Very good. A joyful noise unto the Lord. Very good. Um, prayer cards and attendance cards. The attendance cards are to put in the offering plate as it passes, and if you have anything you want to share on the back, feel free to do that, and if you'd like, I'll share that as a prayer concern or a joy the next week in worship. But there are also the other prayer cards that um, Judy will come around and pick up so that we can include them in our prayers this morning. Okay? Well, my friends, if there are no other announcements, then let's make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Let's stand and join together in our opening praise. We'll sing verses 1 and 5 of Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Next slide, Tom. Uh, no, we're not hearing you. I don't know. Your word. 
Uphold us according to your promise, that we may live. Deal with us according to your steadfast love. We'll now sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus, 526. now in the opening prayer. Lord, your weeds are sweet to taste, sweeter than honey. Let them be our daily meditation and our study. Give us ears to hear, for we marvel at your instruction. Train us in righteousness, grant us patience and persistence, and equip us for every good work. Inspire our faith and give us the wit of message. Guide our feet, keep us from every false way, for you alone speak the words of life. Amen. You may be seated. I will come around and pick up your prayer cards after the scripture reading. Reading from Jeremiah 31, verses 27 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. And just as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, the parents have eaten our sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. 
I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And from 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 15. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, a descendant of David. That is my gospel for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not changed. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory, and saying is sure, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words which do no good but only ruin those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved of him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly exclaiming the word of truth. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 18, and it's verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he refused. But later, he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. <clears throat> and will not God grant justice? Thank you to the, his chosen ones who cry to him day and night, will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them, and yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Thus ends this reading of the good news. Let's pray. <clears throat> Beloved Lord, we thank you for your presence with us and for the gift of your word. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So, this passage from Luke comes at a very interesting place. Mm -hmm. Jesus has begun transitioning the conversation to some discussions with people about the coming of the end of history, God's fulfillment of history. I'm going to open my book so I can find it. Yeah. He's talked a lot in chapter 17 about God's desire to seek out people who are lost and to prepare for the time to come when all things will be brought to completion. In fact, the people who ask him, when is history going to end? He says to them, well, God's already begun that work, right? And says some version of, you're not to know the time or the place, but you do need to be prepared, right? And then this chapter shifts over to conversations about the rich and the poor and 
discipleship in the midst of all of that conversation. And so we begin with uh, this could happen kind of scenario, and perhaps has happened, right? A widow and a judge who is labeled by Jesus as being unjust. And to prepare a bit for this conversation, we need to go back into the book of Deuteronomy, where we get some sense, some instruction, if you will, for what judges were expected to be and what they were expected to do um, for the covenant community of Israel. Okay? So I'm just going to read a couple of verses from Deuteronomy. It's from chapter 1. Give the members of your community a fair hearing and judge rightly between one and another, whether citizen or resident alien. You must not be partial in judging. Hear out the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. Interesting, hmm? It was the responsibility of the judges within the covenant community, and that's what this judge is in Jesus' story, to help people be made whole, right? To declare God's judgment where necessary and to establish shalom, peace, right relationships, justice. A tall order, is it not? You know, I had a conversation not long ago with a colleague of mine who was a lawyer in their first vocation, and we have talked frequently about how the justice system, as we experience it, does not have this same kind of mandate, or perhaps it is, it's to help, it has a role to play, right, an important role to play. But there are lots of circumstances for which it is really difficult to actually come to a just resolution that makes everything right. Hmm? We've had a couple of those instances in the news this week. The verdict in the Parkland shooter trial, the sentencing phase, where the law dictates that to have the death penalty, you have to have a unanimous vote of the jury. And there are all kinds of conversations, all kinds of hurt feelings on all sides of the issue because for some, the life imprisonment verdict is not enough. What will be resolved the family's pain? We don't have an answer to that. We're not those families. The system did what it could. And there they are. Everybody's living with the outcome. But I don't think anybody would argue that even with the trial and knowing who's guilty and knowing that there's some sentencing, that that in and of itself is going to bring the kind of healing that is really needed there. Hmm? And perhaps the same thing could be said. I don't know anybody from Connecticut, but the civil penalties, um, in the Sandy Hook issue? Does a billion dollars make it better in that judgment? I don't know the answer to that either. And yet the system did what it could. Right? It lifted up what happened. It exposed the cruelty of the denial of the Sandy Hook shooting. It laid bare the hypocrisy that was part of the denial. It placed blame where it belonged. And yet, those children, those teachers, will not rise again in this world, right? Is it enough? I'm not sure if I were in their shoes, what would make it enough? So this is a tall order that Deuteronomy gives its judges. You are here to bring peace within the community. You're to be fair, impartial, 
judge the great and the unimportant alike, and not be intimidated because you are sitting in the seat that God has placed you in to try to render judgment so that this community can be made whole. And so we come to this story, where based on that descriptor of the judge, we discover immediately that he is completely unqualified for the job because he just doesn't give a patoot. He doesn't care about the people who come to him and need help. And it doesn't matter to him what God thinks of him. Right? So I suppose we could spend some time drawing parallels to the present moment, but we won't go there. Right? But it's clear, right, that in this story, Jesus is calling out the judge because he has a wider point to make. Right? Back a little bit to taking things to court and knowing that that ne can't necessarily, it doesn't always necessarily bring resolution. Once upon a time, when we first began looking at and working on the issue of how to handle complaints of sexual abuse by clergy toward their parishioners in our conference, um, most of the consultants that we worked with in establishing those policies and procedures and just teaching us about the dynamics of that said to us that when people have experienced this, right, when bring, people bring forward a complaint if they do not believe that they are heard by the people who receive those complaints and who have the authority to do something about them, that is when they take a legal route because they've taken the route available to them to resolve it within the faith community and they have been turned away. Hmm. You could say and accurately so, I think, that the Boy Scout lawsuit over past sexual abuse is exactly an is an example of exactly that kind of thing. Decades and decades, people took their complaints to the people who had something that they could do about it and had the authority to do it, and they chose not to. They just pretended it wasn't going on. And that's how the lawsuits began, right? which is right because that's their recourse. What that tells us is that this woman is coming before the judge because she has no other recourse. This is her last resort. This is the thing she needs, the thing that she requires in order to have justice served for her. Now, we have to think a minute about the special place in God's heart for widows and orphans and resident aliens, right? The foreigners in the midst of the covenant community. The economic support of widows and orphans was dependent upon family members being willing to do that for them. If a widow's husband died, if a woman's husband died and she became a widow, and there were no other people in the family, as in the men, who were willing to marry her in order to have children and pass on the family line for their brothers, as well as provide economic support for those widows, they really had no recourse. There were very few things that were open to them for money making, and they did not fare well in society. And the same thing was true for orphans. So you see in Leviticus and Deuteronomy laws about when you glean the fields, don't pick up everything that falls because you need to let the widows and the orphans come and get what falls to the ground so that they have something to eat. They are given special protection within the covenant community of Israel, and it is, it is God's command that the resident aliens, the widows and the orphans, always be given uh, priority because their suffering is great if no one will care for them, right? If no one makes room for them. 
And so it is the case with this woman. She doesn't really care about the character of the judge. She just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back until she wears him down. And he decides, the only way I'm going to get rid of her is to do what she asked me to do. And so whatever kind of, of justice she was seeking, eventually he grants it. And then Jesus flips this, sort of, to some teaching on prayer and teaching about God. So, what does it say to us about who God is? and about, then, who Jesus is. Have you noticed that when Jesus teaches and when he heals, casts out demons and those kinds of things, he goes directly to where the suffering is? He notices the things that nobody else notices, the people who are on the outside, who are marginalized and suffering, and those are the people he goes to. And then he tells stories about them and he helps them to be healed, right? Now, you know, this might be a generic scenario, but it's still a teaching moment, yeah? Hmm? He's saying to people, look at this situation. This should have been resolved long before it ever came to a judge. But then let's talk about prayer and the role of prayer in all of this. Hmm? First and foremost, he says, this teaches us about God, about who God is. Right? If an unjust judge will eventually grant the request of someone who is suffering and needs justice, why would God not hear your petitions? God who loves you, who is invested in you, who wants all to be well with you, why wouldn't God not come to your aid if you place your plea before God's feet. So persist in prayer, he says. Ask for what you need. Continue to ask. Pour out your pain before the Lord. Do everything you can to let your need be known because God who loves you wants to know that need and wants to respond. What could be better, yes? Although we might just say that sometimes that response sometimes takes longer than we want it to. Yeah. Hmm? So the character of God is as Jeremiah describes here. Right? First, God is in, t in contention with the people of Israel. But then in this passage, which, by the way, we sometimes read during Advent. Hmm? Don't know if we do this year or not. He says... It is God's intent not to just res not to reside in a place, but to reside in people. I want this to be a time of renewal for my people Israel, this time of pain and of exile that they are going through right now will come to an end. And when that time comes, I will establish a new relationship that is my heart connected to their heart. They will not have to ask what I want because they will know. Right? They will not have to ask um, for clarity on what it is I expect them to do because they will know. Right? They will live as my covenant people and they will have a fresh start. Right? No longer will the sins of the ancestors be visited upon this generation but each generation, each person will answer for themselves. A fresh start, a new life, is what is promised here. A new covenant with the people of Israel. So in this shift, we see it moving forward and Jesus picking up this prophetic voice. That God's purpose with Israel and with us is not to bring us... <coughs> to a difficult end, but to walk with us and love us and meet our need and be present to us so that when we suffer, our suffering can be redeemed. Mm -hmm. 
So that's about God. God is not this unjust judge who is not going to pay attention until absolutely required to. Hmm? But then what about this persistence in prayer? How does it apply to our unjust judge? Hmm? Because we can get, can't we, that God's care for the widow and the orphan and the alien resident, hmm? the resident alien, as the biblical words show, <coughs> we get that God has special concern for them, but what about this unjust judge? What is the role of prayer for this judge? Is it possible in this story when Jesus asks the question, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He is actually talking about that judge. Perhaps faith for that judge, for the people who are not seeing the kingdom at work in Jesus' life, in his ministry, that he addresses earlier before this text, perhaps the role of prayer for them is to find a way to ask God's help in having compassion for the suffering in their midst. And like this unjust judge who is in a position of authority to make things better for people, to turn his authority into something that makes things right for the people who come before him. It is not that the unjust judge doesn't have his own suffering. No doubt he does. And we can have confidence, can't we, that God cares about that suffering and is able to provide whatever is needed to make that whole. Hmm? But there's something more to it because the judge, in his position of power, authority, privilege, has the capacity to relieve the suffering of others. And if he does not do it, then he needs to be changed so that he is willing to live in God's light in the work that he does. Oh boy. And so for both us, we can identify maybe with both of the characters in this story. The widow who has a need that cannot be met except by going before God. The healing she wants, the wholeness she needs, whatever it is that's required to relieve her suffering, she takes it before God. And she is encouraged in that. So when we are hard-pressed and short on hope, we can trust that what is true for her will be true for us. That God's love for her, God's love for us, is what will prevail when we make the asks, when we come to God. But the other thing is also true, that when we are not immediately suffering, or not suffering as others perhaps are in this world, each of us is in the place of this judge who, in our own small way, whatever we're doing walking this earth, our own small way, have some power, some capacity, some authority, perhaps even a place of privilege sometimes, where we are in a position to relieve the suffering of others, to see it for what it is, and not to call judgment upon it, that it is a character flaw or something that they are not doing for themselves, but to see the need and to meet it and to say, we do this because this is what God wants us to do. These are the kinds of acts that build the kingdom. Hmm? Yeah. There are all kinds of places across this world where we can see the need for disciples of Jesus Christ to place our petitions before the Lord that we be allowed to see the suffering and to know how we can do something about it. Hmm? I was reading an article just yesterday 
about the refugee problem in Europe, which, remember, began with the Syrian conflict, which, by the way, is still going on, and has been exacerbated by the war that Russia inflicted upon Ukraine. Germany alone has received over 700,000 refugees from that war. Didn't get numbers on Poland, but it's probably just as high, right? And what are they doing? They are going out of their way to find ways to give those people a place that they can call home and a fresh start. They are not seen, although we recognize the rising nationalism across all of the world that is pushing against outsiders, right? The resident aliens. It's happening here, it's happening all across the world. And yet people are still making the choice to be welcoming. Even in the face of cruelty that is being inflicted upon refugees and seekers of asylum in places all across the world, even in our own country. This places both a burden, a promise, and a hope upon us. That when we pray, not if, but when we pray, that in the positions where we find ourselves, we are given whatever guidance we need, the light for the path, if you will, to make the suffering of others lighter. We are to listen for God's voice and how we might respond. Because Jesus knows the only way that peace and healing and hope will come is the, by the outstretched hand of people who are invested in one another's well-being and are willing to express God's love with generosity. And so it is before us, oh God, oh, oh, my friends. The Son of Man comes to seek out and save the lost, Jesus tells us. And we ourselves are called to pay attention to how he moves in the world and to pray unceasingly for how we might walk with him. And when we do, the promise is that we will be shown the way and given what we need to meet the moment. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's join together in singing Change My Heart, O God. It's um, 2152 in this faith we sing. Let us pray.
gracious and loving God, we come before you this day with joy and thanksgiving for your life among us, for your presence in the world, for the promise that you are still active and our capacity to see it. We share with joy that the Wright's nephew, Aaron, um, who's in a serious bike accident, has made great progress and is ahead of schedule in his rehabilitation. We give you thanks and praise for Bob Birch's successful surgery and pray for his ongoing healing. God of hope and promise, hear our prayer. We pray this day um, for our bishop, who is back to work now after medical leave, but who, for health reasons, is planning to retire at the end of this year. We pray for Bishop Haller for the elections that are coming up, and we ask that um, your presence and your spirit be with all of our bishops as they try to lead the church. God of hope and promise, hear our prayers. We offer our prayers this day for our upcoming elections, for the people who are running and willing to give of themselves um, for the sake of our society and its governance, for the people who are working and running the polls, for their safety, for their energy, so that they can do their jobs well, and for people, all of us as citizens, who will see this as a call to vote, so that we might take ownership of our present and our future as a nation. God of hope and promise, hear our prayers. We pray this day for um, places where violence is reigning. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine. We lift before you the increasing attacks on police in our nation and the strain it reflects in community relationships. We pray, O oh God, that in these places of violence, first that you will give the people who are working for peace resolve that they will continue to work for the good of all and for the long-term well-being of those communities. And we pray that you will keep those peacekeepers, both the negotiators and um, those in the fight for um, who are holding off the attacks, we pray that you'll help keep them safe. God of hope and promise, hear our prayers. We pray for the people of Haiti who are under attack from gang violence, who are asking the United Nations for help. Be with them, O oh God, in this work that the people of Haiti might live in peace. God of hope and promise, hear our prayers. We pray for the ongoing hurricane recovery in Puerto Rico and Florida. We ask, dear God, that you give persistence, endurance, strength, and peace to all who are involved in the recovery efforts. Um, give them what they need so that they can keep working for the healing of their communities and the rebuilding that is taking place. God of hope and promise, hear our prayers. We pray for the harvest that is going on here and in other places in this hemisphere across the world. We ask that you keep the farmers safe and we give you thanks for the abundance of what you give in what they are harvesting. God of hope and promise, hear our prayers. We pray for um, health needs that are known to us this day. We pray for Deb, Jen Foster's sister, who's having eye surgery this week. Um, and this is a repeat surgery because the last procedure did not go well. We pray for Steve Grant, who's recovering from heart attack last Friday and had a stent placed and hopefully will be released from the hospital. We pray for Bob Birch, who had surgery on Friday. We ask for all of them that you grant them your healing mercies. Um, 
Help them be strengthened in body and spirit that they may recover and thrive. God of hope and promise, hear our prayers. We pray, O oh God, for children who are caught in the middle of divorce. We pray that they will know their value and know that they are loved, that they don't have to choose between their parents, but their parents will always work for what is best for them. We ask, O oh God, for families everywhere who are experiencing tension and fracture and ask that you reside deeply with them, that they may know your love and be given what they need to cope with their challenges. God of hope and promise, hear our prayers. Oh God, we pray also for your church everywhere, for ourselves as part of that great um, population of disciples across the world. We ask that you help us to be authentic before you, letting you know of our need, calling to you always in prayer, and seeking from you always the guidance for how it is that you want us to live in the world and to meet the need of those whose suffering you see. Strengthen us, dear Lord, for all that you are placing before us. And in that process, help us to know with assurance that you are always with us and that your presence goes before us and that we need have no fear that um, we will not be up to the challenge. God of hope and promise, hear our prayer. We pray these name, things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, dear ones, I invite you to give yourselves and your gifts to God through your tithes and offerings. And let's also join together in singing There's a Song, verses 2, 4, and 5. One thing I didn't put in the prayers, but I will note, Doug and I celebrated our 33rd wedding anniversary on Friday. <laughs> We're both still alive and standing. <laughs> you know how that goes. Yeah, it's all good. All right, friends, let's join together in the offering prayer. 
Mighty God, bestow your power and strength on these gifts we now return to you. Multiply them as they go forth to share your church and your world. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 583 in our hymnal. It's You Are the Seed, and I invite you to stand as you're able to sing. Proclaim love to all. Be messengers of God's forgiving peace. Be brave and joyful and hopeful because our Lord walks with us. Go in peace. Go in joy. Love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.